Okay, uh, today I'm going to start the session by uh, talking a little bit about the use of continuous spinal analgesia, mainly for labor. I'm not really going to focus on the use of continuous spinal anesthesia for C-section, though I will touch on that briefly. Uh, just by way of disclosure, I will say that in the past I have received some research funding from various companies. However, I do not have any current uh, research funding or financial arrangements with any uh, manufacturers. So, uh, a lot of us think that this is sort of a new novel technique that uh, has uh, developed over the last few years, but really it's one of the oldest tricks we have in our anesthesia uh, toolbox. In fact, the first report of continuous spinal anesthesia goes back over 100 years. It was reported by Dean in a British medical journal, and he reported the use of this technique. He left a, a spinal needle in the patient's canal uh, during general surgical cases, injected local anesthetic, uh, and then gave intermittent injections, rolling the patient over and back as necessary during the procedure. Obviously, rather uh, cumbersome, so it didn't really catch on that well. But the first documented report in obstetrics occurred, uh, or wasn't reported until 1944. This is from Lemon and Hager. There were two uh, general surgeons who worked at Jefferson uh, Hospital in Philadelphia. Uh, they published in the Annals of Surgery, and their report included a, a wide variety of cases, but it did include 140 cesarean deliveries that were done under continuous spinal anesthesia. And this was the apparatus that they used. You can see it's rather, uh, bizarre by our standards. It had this, you, you may recall in the past seeing these old metal gurneys in the hospital wards. Uh, it had a thick foam mattress and they had a cutout in there where they could stick a needle in the patient's back, hook it to this tubing labeled number three there, lay her down or lay the patient down on the mattress uh, and then inject as necessary through that tubing to maintain the anesthesia during the, the procedure. The first report of using this for labor actually was reported in the same year by Heinball and Lang, who were obstetricians who worked at Jefferson University Hospital. And they had seen uh, Lemon and Hager using this device. They walked down the hall and said, hey, can we borrow your table? We'd like to use this in OB. So they uh, used this technique uh, in a number of patients for labor uh, analgesia. Uh, and it's basically the same technique that Lemon Hager reported. They used 5% procaine. They would inject 15 milligrams through that needle catheter apparatus. What they found was that the analgesia worked great. The patients, 96% of them were comfortable within three minutes of the injection. But, uh, and actually sort of persuading the, the reports that we saw when combined spinal epidural analgesia uh, became popular. They noted an apparent acceleration of cer cervical dilation in these patients. However, as you might uh, expect, they reported headaches in uh, the vast majority of these patients, 42%, that were severe but transient, and they did not require any treatment, or I should say they did not receive any treatment. So the modern era of continuous spinal analgesia really began uh, in the late 1980s, and that's when several manufacturers introduced what were called spinal microcatheters. These were much, much smaller catheters than the traditional epidural catheters that we use. Here you see one of the smallest ones. This is a 32 gauge microspinal catheter which actually fits through that 26 gauge spinal needle. Uh, for comparison there, you can see a 20 gauge epidural catheter and an 18 gauge TUI. So much, much finer, much smaller uh, devices than what we're currently used to using for epidural analgesia. The first published report of the use of these for labor analgesia came from Hurley and Lambert, uh, and they reported use of this 32 gauge microspinal catheter placed through the 26 gauge needle. And this was very exciting at the time to uh, obstetric anesthesiologists uh, all over the country, and this ignited a, a firestorm of interest in the technique, you know, and within very few years, there were multiple published reports in the literature. Uh, 
many of them, or at least some of them, from people sitting in this room. Uh, but the anesthesia was dampened rather red or early when it became apparent that were, there were some complications associated with this technique. Now, none of these complications have been reported in the obstetric population, but Riegler, in 1991, reported four cases of cauda equina syndrome. Cauda equina syndrome, as you know, is a sacral and low lumbar <clears throat> neuropathy, uh, which is permanent. It's both motor and sensory uh, in its uh, affect. And this caused the Food and Drug Administration to withdraw all these catheters from the market. I'm sorry, I got to adjust this. It's That's a little. That's a little better. <laughs> uh, basically, the reasoning at that time was that there were no medications approved for continuous spinal administration, so there wasn't any necessity to have a device for continuous spinal medication uh, on the market. So it required all the manufacturers, and there were at least four at that time who were marketing these devices, to withdraw them from the market. But that didn't dampen the initial enthusiasm that a lot of obstetric anesthesiologists felt for this technique. Now, early on, uh, the question became, was this a problem that was inherent to the devices themselves? Was there something uh, toxic about placing uh, these synthetic catheters in a patient's subarachnoid space and leaving there for them there for a continued period of time? Or was it something about the way we were using the catheters that was causing these problems? And fairly early on, the evidence pointed to lidocaine uh, as the culprit here. And what we have since found out is that lidocaine has neurotoxic potential at concentrations that we use clinically. Uh, Bainton, Lambert, Johnson, all these reports indicated that Lidocaine is probably not a good drug for uh, spinal anesthesia, either intermittent or as a continuous spinal technique. 5% uh, lidocaine uh, has been shown to cause irreversible injury in isolated nerve fibers in animal models. 1%, I'm sorry. And the lidocaine threshold for neurotoxicity is much, much lower than any other local anesthetics, with pivocaine in particular in isolated peripheral nerve and neuronal cell models. Now, I just want to highlight this one uh, paper by Malinowski, and this was published in 2002, uh, but it really shows uh, the potential for neurotoxicity with uh, intrathecal lidocaine. And they, uh, pardon me again, is there any way to center the the screen up front here, it's cutting everything off halfway. Anyway, they, they uh, studied a rabbit model, uh, 80 rabbits. Uh, they randomized 60 of these rabbits to receive a single injection of either saline, 5% lidocaine, or ropivacaine at either 0 0.2, 0 0.75, 1, or 2%. Uh, another additional 20 rabbits were randomized to receive chronic intrathecal ropivacaine. Uh, half of these received 0.2 mLs every two days for two weeks, and another uh, 10 rabbits received an infusion. What they found was that in all the rabbits who received ropivacaine, they had no evidence of clinical or histopathological lesions. However, in all the rabbits that received lidocaine, there were only 10 in the study. Two of them had clinical changes consistent with neurotoxicity. And when the rabbits were sacrificed and looked at uh, histologically, all of them had histopathologic changes uh, in their spinal cords. So uh, lidocaine is probably not a great drug that we should be using much anymore. Presumably, most of you are not. Now, uh, getting back to the FDA's withdrawal of these catheters from the market, the problem became trying to convince the FDA that uh, this wasn't a problem with the catheters themselves. They had just been misused by practitioners. In fact, what had turned up with the cardioquina syndromes was that practitioners had been giving very, very large doses 
tetracaine uh, or lidocaine through these catheters, uh, much higher doses than you would ever consider giving as a single shot spinal because the flow through these catheters is so slow that it tends to cause a laminar flow within the CSF if the patient is holding still. And this causes very high local concentrations of the local anesthetic within the spinal canal. So anyway, uh, Arkush and uh, some other anesthesiologists uh, went to the FDA and got approval for an investigational device exemption to publish or to do a randomized controlled multi-center study of a 28 gauge catheter which could be passed through a 22 gauge ramped Sprott needle. This included 429 patients total. Uh, it was randomized in a three to one ratio between continuous spinal patients and epidural patients. And the continuous spinal portion was managed mainly for labor with an intrathecal sufentanil infusion. Uh, patients received bolus injections of small amounts of sufentanil. If they had breakthrough pain, they received bupivacaine through the catheter. If they, pardon me, uh, required surgery, were brought to a C-section, half percent bupivacaine was injected through the catheter. The epidural patients were managed fairly conventionally with a bupivacaine sufentanil solution that was run continuously. Now this is the catheter uh, that was used in that study and uh, I was privileged to be part of that study. I was not part of the uh, initial team that went to the FDA, but you can see these are pretty small catheters, these 28 gauge catheters, and they would fit through that 22 gauge uh, ramped sprout needle there in the center of the slide. It has a little sort of ski slope like uh, portion at the, at the distal portion of the, the, the outlet hole, which sort of deflects the catheter in the direction that the, uh, the needle is aimed, or the, the injection hole is aimed. Just for comparison there, you see a standard 20 gauge epidural catheter. Now, the primary hypothesis that we had in the study was that there would be no difference in the incidence of neurologic complications between the epidural patients and the continuous spinal patients. Secondarily, we wanted to see how well tolerated this was by uh, the laboring mothers, and we felt there would probably be no difference between the two groups in inadequate or failed analgesia, maternal satisfaction, or neonatal outcomes. So, what did we find? Well, with regard to maternal outcomes, there was no difference in the incidence of postpartum weakness or paresthesia. Uh, there were transient uh, paresthesias uh, noted in both groups but all these symptoms were transient. None of them required uh, treatment. And apparently none of them were related to the anesthesia procedure. Uh, regarding maternal outcomes, uh, the only adverse outcome really noted in the study was one patient required naloxone during a C-section, but she had received almost 70 micrograms of intrathecal sufentanil over her labor of the previous 14 hours. Uh, no difference in hypotension, ephedrine use, uh, with regard to catheter removal, uh, the combined spinal catheters were rated considerably more difficult to remove than standard epidural catheters. Here you can see why. I mean, these catheters, quite literally, are not much bigger than the ridges on your fingertips. So very, very fine. Uh, and if you yank on them, they will stretch. So it takes a little getting used to when you try and remove these things from a patient. With regard to efficacy, uh, 88% of the continuous spinal patients thought their analgesia was very good to excellent compared to 81 of the epidural patients. 24-hour uh, satisfaction scores were actually higher in the continuous spinal group, and they had lower pain scores. Really not that surprising over the first 60 minutes of their, uh, their anesthetic. And the percentage of patients who received or achieved very low visual analog pain scores was also uh, higher in the continuous spinal group. Uh, this is very similar to what we see often with uh, combined spinal epidural analgesia. Less motor block in the continuous spinal group. Again, not surprising since they were using primarily an opioid-based technique. No difference in obstetric outcome. C-section rate uh, was the same. 40, or 43 of the uh, spinal anesthesia catheter patients uh, went to C-section and a spinal catheter was used in 41 of those patients. Two of them 
the obstetrician deemed the uh, section to be too urgent to wait for the spinal catheter to work and they were put to sleep. Uh, with regard to neonatal outcomes, no difference in APGARs or the incidence of fetal bradycardia. Problems noted in this study, well, for these very small catheters, it takes a little while to become adept at placing and managing them. Uh, there was a question that the failure rate with epidural or these spinal catheters might be higher than what we would see with epidural catheter. Uh, but as we'll see later this morning probably, uh, this is probably not out of line with uh, reported failure rates for standard epidural analgesia. Finally, the, uh, the incidence of posterior puncture headache, which is the thing everybody seems to focus on, was actually not statistically different between groups. Uh, about 5% of the spinal patients required a blood patch compared to 2% of the epidural patients. Not statistically different, but truth be told, uh, I think there probably is a difference between the groups. Uh, we just didn't enroll enough patients to be, reach statistical significance. Unfortunately, by the time the study was finished, there were no plans to market the catheter because the original sponsor of the study preferred medical products had been merged into another company, uh, Ballard Medical, which was located in Salt Lake City and made primarily hospital hygiene products like soaps and scrubs and things like that. And they, in turn, were uh, taken over by Kimberly Clark, which is uh, more widely known for its consumer uh, product line. Uh, Kimberly Clark looked at the cost of getting this approved and marketed and said, thanks, we'll take a pass. So. Uh, there are no times to, or plans to market this currently, so why, you might say, are we talking about this? Well, it's still the largest study of continuous spinal analgesia that's ever been reported, probably undertaken, and I think it provides us with useful lessons that we can use uh, with the technique, even if we can't use that device. Uh, it provides excellent analgesia, there's no motor block, it's very easy to determine the placement of the catheter, and it provides an excellent route for delivery of other medications <clears throat> should a patient require a cesarean section or other surgical procedures. And we do have other options. Uh, one of these is the SpinoCath device. This is made by B. Braun. <clears throat> it's a 24 gauge catheter, which is 28 inches long, and it's passed through a TUI or Crawford needle, which is placed in the uh, epidural space and the entire thing is passed through that into subarachnoid space has a long stylet through the length of the catheter you yank that out and lead the catheter uh, in the spinal canal uh, this has been reported reportedly used in the obstetric anesthesia population uh, Dresner and colleagues reported use of this system uh, in 34 patients with cardiac disease multiple uh, significant severe lesions uh, with good results. Alonzo, in the same issue of the International Journal, reported the efficacy of the device for elective cesarean section. Unfortunately, this catheter is not available in the U.S. either. Uh, again, uh, Braun looked at the cost of bringing this to the market uh, through the FDA approval process and decided that there was no return on the investment for them. So they have no plans to introduce this in the U.S., though it is available in Europe, and I believe it may be uh, available in Australia and uh, the South Pacific region. However, there is a device which is currently on the market in the U.S. It's this thing called the Wiley Spinal, which is marketed by EpiMed. This is a, a, a bit more complicated system. Uh, it's a 23-gauge catheter, again, 28 inches long. The catheter is threaded over a 27-gauge needle, which is in turn passed through an epidural needle uh, into the uh, intrathecal space. To date, uh, there have not been many published reports of the use of this device in the obstetric population. Uh, the single peer-reviewed publication that is out there is from Tal and colleagues uh, down in Texas, uh, and they reported the use of this catheter for labor analgesia. Uh, 
Uh, it was a very small series, only seven patients. One was managed with intermittent bolus uh, injections and six others were managed with continuous infusion during their labor. One patient went to C-section, but again, very small study, very hard to draw much conclusions from this. One of the patients out of the seven required an epidural blood patch. So what options are we left with? And I should note here that these are off-label uses, uh, not approved uses for these devices. Well, you can always use a standard epidural catheter in the interfecal space, which is probably the way most of us would end up using this technique. And I would urge you to try this technique when you get a wet tap. If you're, you evaluate your patient and you realize that this would be a great technique for this individual patient given their situation and medical uh, problems, and you plan to place this beforehand, pediatric epidural catheters can be used uh, to manage this technique. Uh, and I've used a 24 gauge epidural catheter which can be passed through a 20 gauge TUI needle to use this technique uh, sort of prospectively. Uh, the 20 gauge TUI needle is a little bit smaller than what we usually use for standard epidural analgesia. And the epidural catheter is a little bit smaller, so you do decrease some of the, the complications. Here you see a uh, comparison of the standard adult epidural catheter on the, that would be the left side of the slide, uh, and the pediatric epidural catheter on the right side of the slide. Not a whole lot of difference, but can see it is a little bit smaller than uh, the adult versions. So if you decide to use this, or you're thinking about using this, who might be appropriate candidates for uh, this technique? Well, one that I find where this is particularly used for are patients with prior back surgery. Uh, the clock just stopped on me, gave me a start there. Uh, many of you may have had the experience of going into a labor room for a patient who's requesting labor analgesia. You get them sitting up, you look at their back and see something like this. You have the stem to stern scar from the cervical spine all the way down to the, the sacrum. Uh, and to at, top it all off, you see the small scar from where they took the uh, bone fusion graft from the iliac crest. Obviously, it's going to be very difficult to place an epidural catheter in this patient. Even if you place it, it's going to be difficult to get good uniform spread of your analgesia. In these situations, uh, continuous spinal catheters can provide a valuable option. If you get into the interfecal space, usually you can get a very uh, uniform, reasonable block for these patients. And often, as you see at the bottom of this slide here, even if they've been instrumented and fused, there's often still a, a fairly virgin uh, inner space down in the lower lumbar region. Uh, patients who have difficult landmarks where you can't figure exactly where you're aiming your needle or which direction, up, down, left, right, sideways, uh, the Continuous spinal technique where you're placing your needle directly in interfecal space gives you a good hard endpoint. Now, okay, I got my needle in the right place. I can manage this now. Where you might subject this patient to multiple attempts to try and find an epidural space and even then uh, be hamstrung by poor spread of your local anesthetic. Uh, the morbidly obese patient can be a challenge. We're all aware. Uh, getting the epidural into the correct space with the multiple confusing uh, layers of uh, fascia and tissue and adipose and whatever you have to get through, even if you have a, uh, an appropriate length of uh, TUI needle. Others that you might consider this would be patients with cardiac disease. We saw that earlier report from Dresner and colleagues that uh, this works very well and can provide a very stable analgesic in patients with significant serious lesions. Uh, patients who might have a high probability of going to C-section, but at present they are laboring. Uh, and a little bit more controversially, controversially, perhaps patients with a difficult airway. But I am not naive enough to think you're all gonna run out and start employing this technique right away because, let's be honest, you're all scared you're gonna give your patients headaches. Uh, and that's a reasonable fear. But 
we've all been in a situation where we're placing an epidural, everything's going along swimmingly until kaboom, you know, suddenly you're not where you want to be. And at this point, I would say, don't panic. It's all of our natural reaction. Our reflex is to yank the tui out, but don't do it. Put your finger over the hole, put the stylet back in the, the tui needle, uh, and think for a moment. The die is already cast here. The damage has been done, so to speak. You've made the dural puncture. So make the most of this. You have an opportunity to give the patient a great anesthetic. We know that this is a reliable, flexible technique. The question is, you already have a dural puncture with this 18 gauge Tui needle, and you're gonna put a 20 gauge epidural catheter through there. Is this, what's this gonna to do to the risk of post-dural puncture headache? Will this make the headache worse? Well, there's considerable evidence that this might actually lower the incidence of post-dural puncture headache if you put in a continuous spinal catheter. Sheila Cohen reported this back in 1994. Dennehy and colleagues reported it in, uh, again, 1998. And even Scott Siegel, who you'll hear from later this morning, uh, presented an abstract to this effect back in 1999 at SOAP. Uh, Mark Vandeveld did a prospective randomized study of placement of epidural catheter or placement of intrathecal catheters following posterior puncture headache. They actually find a slightly lower incidence of posterior puncture headache in the continuous spinal group after a wet tap. Uh, at least one study indicates that the risk of posterior puncture head headache may be a lot lower if you put in a continuous spinal uh, anesthetic. IAD and colleagues in regional anesthesia and pain medicine back in 2003 reported a 61% incidence of, or 61% reduction in need for epidural blood patch just by placing a spinal catheter. And they decreased it by 96% if they left that catheter in for 24 hours. Now, I will say no one has been able to replicate IAD's results from this paper. So most people take this with a very large grain of salt. However, morbidly obese patients tend to be less prone to develop posterior puncture headaches after uh, continuous spinal anesthesia or posterior puncture headache. Uh, Farr and colleagues and Pate both have uh, cited this. FAR reported a decrease in the headache rate of 46% when uh, in posterior puncture headache, just in morbidly obese patients, so uh, a more useful technique. But uh, another prospective trial looking at the incidence of headache, mainly uh, coming from Russell over in the UK, this is a uh, multi-center trial. 97 patients, half received the recited epidural catheter and half received an intrathecal catheter, which was left in place for 24 hours, basically an attempt to replicate IAD's findings uh, in that earlier uh, report. What they found was there was no difference in posterior puncture headache rate, but they did note that there was a higher risk of posterior puncture headache if your epidural was placed with a 16-gauge TUI versus an 18-gauge TUI over a two-fold increase. So I think a real lesson from this study, if you're still using 16-gauge TUI needles to place your epidural catheters, please get with the program. This is the 21st century. You really should not be doing that. Uh, of course, if you really want to know the answer to any question nowadays, you do a meta-analysis. Uh, Heeson reported this in International Journal Post, uh, International Journal. And they found the risk of posterior puncture headache uh, not significantly different after intrathecal catheter insertion. And they even separated out IAD study to look at the results of the other studies without that confounding things. Again, no difference. However, in both situations, they did find a lower risk of epidural blood patch requirement in the patients who'd had intrathecal catheters. So even if the catheter doesn't reduce the headache rate, it may reduce the need for another procedure in these patients. Anyway, what makes you think the next epidural is gonna work? Failure rates for de novo epidurals have been reported up to 20% in multiple studies. So if you're gonna do this, the question becomes, how do you do it? And these are my personal practices. This is not published research or peer-reviewed trials. Uh, I use the same initial injection I use for combined spinal epidural analgesia. 
25 mics of fentanyl with 2.5 milligrams of bupivacaine. And then you can run it either as an intermittent bolus, giving the same thing when necessary, when the patient becomes uncomfortable, uncom or as an, a continuous infusion. You can even do this in a patient-controlled setting, uh, as reported by Tim Pavey from Perth, Australia. You take the patient to C-section, half percent bupivacaine, incremental injections, uh, works great, should rarely need to use more than 10 milligrams. So just to summarize, uh, continuous spinal analgesia is a reliable technique, it's extremely versatile, the maternal satisfaction rates are very high for the analgesia that results, and the only drawback is that modestly higher postural puncture headache rate. And you got to weigh that against the advantages of the technique, particularly in high risk or select populations. Thank you. Uh.